Moving forward. I'd like to talk about the development of transport behavior and mobility patterns in Santiago de Chile, more precisely how and why transport behavior changed with the introduction of a completely new public transport system for the city. Why Santiago de Chile? It's uh, actually a very interesting case study area with a look at the important transportation changes the city has gone through in the last decade. Before 2007, the city was characterized by two parallel existing systems which had nothing to do with each other. On the one hand, some few metro lines, which were little used, not only due to very limited network, but also due to relatively high prices. On the other hand, we had uh, something very typical of many cities in developing countries and emerging economies, a completely deregulated bus system, which is characterized by a rich oversupply of many private operators offering services in their private buses. Of course, uh, this somehow chaotic service was somehow source of uh, frequent accidents, noise and pollution, but also somehow convenient for its users due to uh, people were just able to get out of the house, take the bus wherever they wanted because there weren't any bus stops and to cross the entire city within the same bus, just paying one single fare and not changing between buses or from bus towards the metro. Anyhow, with a look at the noise and pollution and frequent accidents, also to the fact that more and more people tried to avoid to take these somehow caustic buses and to go by private car if they had one, public authorities decided to completely modernize the existing system and to introduce a so-called bus rapid transit system. This vocabulary describes a system where buses, similar to like a metro or tram system, run entirely on their own corridors. Uh, they are high capacity, very comfortable articulated buses which can capture a lot of passengers. And normally bus rapid transit system also includes similar to a metro a specific ticketing system and uh, a specific sophisticated passenger information system. The so-called Transantiago system was also meant to be unified with the public metro in order to have a tariff union so people should be able to transfer between both modes just paying one, once a fare, one single fare enabled by an electronic ticketing system. All this very ambitious, sophisticated system was implemented finally in February 2007 in Santiago. Maybe not that surprising, the situation at the beginning was very catastrophic because people were completely lost. The change was just too uh, drastic and too abrupt all at once. The reasons for this problems were on the one hand related to a lot of technical failures. So the network was not very well designed at the beginning, not enough buses had been purchased, the bus lines hadn't been constructed completely etc. But also due to the fact that people were just completely lost, they didn't know how to make use of the new system. And that's actually where my research started. I wanted to see what are exactly the problems for the people and what impact these problems have on their way to move within the city, uh, so on the way to construct their daily life and uh, on their general organization of daily activities. And for this purpose, I selected five out of 37 different city districts, which are very different concerning ones that their income situation, so low, medium, high average incomes and also concerning their uh, accessibility conditions. So some have access to the metro, some not, some depend exclusively on bus-based transport, and uh, which is important to understand, uh, especially the higher income areas often have very good access to the car, while the lower income areas, especially the periphery, normally depend exclusively on public transport. We call this captive ridership, which means they don't have any alternative, they have to go by public transport. So obviously not all people experienced the problems in the same way. It, as I said, it really depended on how much people depended on the use of public transport. And I uh, prepared four maps where you see the 37 di districts of the metropolitan area. Green value always demonstrates a low value and red value always a high value. And you see, in fact, you can see two main things. On the one hand, you see a high correlation between the average incomes and the access to a private car, 
also private car ownership and also the number of daily trips in private transport. Uh, on the other hand, you also see that all the high income people concentrate in one sector of the, the city in the so-called eastern cone of wealth, which is highlighted in red color. And which notices, which demonstrates the uh, Santiago is characterized by strong social segregation. And people living there are in a better and double sense better off because, on the one hand, they have good access to the private car, they don't depend on public transport, which means they have high mobility accessibility. But on the other hand, they have also, they are better off because in this area, all important shopping, uh, leisure, working and uh, recreation facilities concentrate, so they don't have to move far, even though they are more mobile than other people. The problems of Transantiago can be classified in two main groups. On the one hand, we have the so-called technical problems. I also mentioned the network, the bus lines, the, the bus stops, etc. And obviously, these things didn't work very well at the beginning, but the solutions are rather obvious, even though they take time and cost. Uh, the solutions were done subsequently in the three years after the implementation of Transantiago. But there's also a whole palette of problems related to people's travel competencies, skills, habits and preferences. And uh, those, p uh, those problems turned out to be much more long-lasting and difficult to, to resolve than probably public authorities had expected in the beginning. So just to evoke one example of people's travel competencies uh, is the access to information on the transport supply. Before, during the deregulated system, people were really used to muddle through, to inform about the supply in an informal way. They asked people they knew or they directly asked the bus driver in order to get to know where, how to get from door to door. Now, the Transantiago, as a much more sophisticated system, is based on a proper passenger information system, including network maps, including an internet platform, a telephone hotline, etc. And as you can see here on this graphic, independence of the level of education of people, lower educated people still rely, even in the Transantiago, on informal information sources, which is much more difficult now than during the deregulated system. And only the higher educated groups really make use of this internet platform, network maps, etc. And according to this, on the second chart, you also see that people themselves declare different easiness or difficulties to use the Transantiago. People with a lower level of education accordingly declared to find the Transantiago very difficult to use, while higher educated groups normally didn't have any problems. But in that sense, you also have to see that those people rarely use public transport. So they don't depend on it and evidently it's easier for them. Uh, this is just one example of uh, problems in travel competences. I could evoke numerous other examples. In general, to sum up, the problems refer really to the need now to organize a trip in beforehand. So the need to charge the electronic ticket before entering the bus, to uh, decide about the best connection, to access the correct transport stop, and finally also to do transfers. And transfers, this is a universal phenomenon, to change between mode is always something which is not really liked by people. And uh, also here in Europe, people often prefer to stay longer in the same vehicle in order to avoid to transfer between modes instead of really having a short trip but change once or twice between the different modes. That's about the problems. I'd still like to talk about the impacts this problematic transport system had on people's daily life. And in my survey, about 12% explicitly justified to have changed their travel patterns and their daily travel behavior due to problems with the Transantiago. And these people were especially, again, captive riders, which are mostly lower income people without access to a private car, elderly and also many women, because women still don't have always a driving license in Santiago de Chile. And uh, those people, first of all, they travel less, especially for leisure purposes, which means now many trips, for, especially for leisure purposes, they used to do during the deregulated system, they just have skipped and they prefer to stay at home. They travel shorter distances, which means they remain more often close to their place of residence where they can walk or cycle to in order to avoid motorized transport. And third, in the context of modal splits, so the share of the different modes uh, 
uh, used by the inhabitants of Santiago de Chile, we see that the private car use has considerably increased. Of course, bus use is now replaced by an important part by the metro because the metro network is expanding and thanks to the tariff union, people have better access to the metro, but also by private car and also by taxis. And this, from an environmental point of view, also from a social point of view, is problematic. This brings me to the conclusion. Just, I want to stress three main things. First of all, uh, concerning the travel competences, I'd like to stress that in areas or in regions where important transportation changes are on their way, people have really to be taught and to learn how to make use of a new system. Changes should never be too drastic, too abrupt. People have to get introduced smoothly into the new system, otherwise uh, they won't be able to make use of it. Second thing I'd like to stress, um, remembering the changes in trip frequencies and distances, that transport is one central, maybe not the most important, but one central prerequisite for people to participate in societal life. So without moving, people can't recreate work, study, etc. That means that public transport is very important, especially for the so-called captive riders, for the people who don't have any possibility to move with other modes than uh, public transport by bus or by metro. And third, last but not least, also linked to the second one, there's still uh, the fact that many people now prefer to go by private car instead of going by bus, even though the objective of uh, Transantiago was also to attract previous car users as new public transport users. Um, of course, it can't be goal now to provide everyone with a car in order to resolve uh, transport conditions for everyone. It's a potential that people depend on public transport, so the dependence can also be analyzed in a good way to say that people have to use public transport, so it's a potential to implement a more sustainable transport system in a city. But uh, in that sense, it's not enough to provide only a more well-working public transport system. It has also to be worked about um, the car and its attitudes. So on the one hand, of course, car can become less attractive by restrictions and by becoming more expensive, but we also have to work about the reputation of the car. In Santiago, and I think also elsewhere, the car continues to be an important symbol of status, of independence, privacy, comfortable traveling, the maximum of mobility. And as long as people don't get aware of the problems related to frequent car use, such as congestion, pollution, space consumption, etc., they will never be willing to shift towards alternative modes, such as public transport.